I was born and grew up in Denmark. Uh, and you know, these are countries which, where the government spends taxes and spends approximately twice the level of the United States. Mm -hmm. And while I am very sympathetic to many of your spending proposals, especially on the things you mentioned on early childhood and single payer and the like, I also know that these are countries that heavily tax everybody, not just the rich people, middle classes, they have consumption taxes mm -hmm. on everything of 20%. So while I'm very sympathetic to what you say, my, my sense is still that you would like to spend as a Scandinavian, but not tax as one. Is well, that correct? We have, the answer is, you raised some very good points. Comparing the US with Europe and countries in Europe would be naive, oversimplistic, and offend a bunch of people. Land masses are complex. But I'm gonna go ahead and compare them anyways, because some of the comparisons between Europe and the US remain way too superficial. Read my lips. No It's not uncommon to obsess over the usual suspects for why the U.S. is less equal than Europe and also has less good quality, affordable social programs. The analysis is simple. The U.S. has more billionaires and taxes them less. Europe has less billionaires, but taxes them more. Need a larger tax base to fund popular social programs and also less inequality? Just raise the taxes on the rich, like the Europeans do. Now, although the tax rates for rich people explain some part of the difference, it doesn't explain enough. Europeans can afford good social programs because a lot of Europeans pay a lot for them, mainly through indirect taxes. And Europeans are also more equal before tax is even factored in because a lot of the social programs they pay more for also reduce pre-tax inequality. But the US has, so far, been unable to adopt the same. Why? Well, in part because taxing the wealthiest of society is easier to advertise and justify than taxing everybody a lot more. In Europe, most people don't really need to be convinced about paying for their welfare states because it works sufficiently for most of them. But in the US, there's an intimate struggle with deciding whether pre-distribution will be a state, local, or federal solution. Part of the reason is that in the US, the federal government gets the most media attention while state and local governments can avoid scrutiny. This means that minimum wage hikes in the US are practically always seen as a responsibility for the federal government, which has to delicately balance different costs of living, like laborers living in New York City, and miners living in West Virginia. In Europe though, a country like France or Denmark can opt for different geographically sensitive policy while also being held more directly into account because the assignment of responsibility is clearer to its citizens. There's this definition of a wicked problem, which um, is circulating around in the literature, which suggests that a wicked problem is wicked if it has um, so many dimensions to it that you can't go at one angle to the problem and try to fix it. And I think school finance is like that. So school districts get money from their local communities in the form of property taxes. They'll also get money from the state, and the state might give them money through multiple formulas. And then a, a portion, a much smaller portion, about 9 or 10%, comes from the federal government. So even if you try to solve the problem at, say, the state level, if there are these other funding sources that come with their own own restrictions, which ultimately affect how the money gets used in schools. In Connecticut, a U.S. state, a school in Bridgeport will be poorer by virtue of being surrounded by poorer properties, while a school in Greenwich will be richer because it is surrounded by richer properties. This is because local taxes are largely funded by property values in the area. However, this concept fails to explain everything. Educational disparities also exist across Europe and within its countries. The U.S. is not unique for having a system that predisposes poor children to poor resources. Education systems are complex, Finland is not the same as Sweden, and resources invested in education and the quality that follows does not seem like a linear relationship. The U.S.'s unique situation is that its quality does not match the amount that the U.S. actually spends on it. One of the problems with answering why resources don't match the quality you would expect in the U.S. is because the decentralized nature of school districts makes it pretty difficult to actually identify what spending works and what doesn't. Overall, there are some indications that, compared with Europe, the amount of staffing, the associated health and retirement benefits, alongside transportation, all add up to more costs for the American education system. But the differences don't end there. In the 1990s, as the crime rate was plummeting, as American life was getting safer and safer, Americans freaked out and thought that if they take their eyes off their children, the children will be abducted. Now this goes back, the fear was stoked by cable TV in the 1980s, there were a few high-profile abductions. 
But it's not until the 1990s that we really start locking kids up and saying, you cannot be outside until you're 14 or 15. We took this essential period of childhood from about 8 to 12, when kids throughout history have practiced independence, have gotten into adventures, have made rafts and floated down the Mississippi River. We took that period and said, you don't get to practice independence until it's too late, until that period is over. Kids in the U.S. are raised differently than kids in Europe. Some blame the planning that produced more isolated American families, some the over-paranoia towards kidnapping in the 1980s, and others point to an increasingly competitive environment where parents try to give their children an edge over the others by helicoptering them. It's really not that far a stretch to say that many European children could be considered to have more freedom at an earlier age. American children are less likely to be able to walk to school alone compared with European children, which you can of course connect to overall crime rates, and authoritative school policy is still much more accepted across the US than it is in Europe. So, the, the real key to uh, the distinctiveness of America is mm -hmm. the structure of our government. One part of it, of course, is the independence of the judiciary. But there's, there's, there's a lot more. There are very few countries in the world, for example, that, that have a bicameral legislature. Oh, well, England has a House of Lords for the time being, but the House of Lords has no substantial power. They can just make the Commons pass a bill a second time. France has a Senate, it's honorific. Italy has a Senate, it's honorific. Very few countries have two separate bodies in the legislature equally powerful. That's a lot of trouble, as you gentlemen doubtless know, to get the same language through two different bodies elected in a different fashion. Very few countries in the world have a, a separately elected uh, chief executive. Sometimes I go to Europe to talk about separation of powers. A and when I get there, I find that all I'm talking about is independence of the judiciary. Because the Europeans don't even try to divide the, the two political powers, the two political branches, the legislature and the chief executive. In all of the parliamentary countries, the chief executive is the creature of the legislature. There's never any disagreement between them and, the, and, and the, the prime minister, as there is sometimes between you and the president. When, when there's a disagreement, they just kick him out. They have a no confidence vote, a new election, and they get a prime minister who agrees with the legislature. And, uh, you know, the, the Europeans... The difference is simple. European countries are mainly nations, not federations. A European state, if it existed, could never be the same as the U.S. Written in their constitution, U.S. states are modeled after the federal government, and state governments, which mirror the one above, usually have their own chamber of representatives, a senate, and also have an executive mirrored after their president. In Europe, if there was any state that was above the countries that made it up, it would have to be modeled from those very different countries beneath it, rather than serving as a model for the countries below it. This is an important difference because it means that any kind of European government would have to balance parliamentary systems with presidential republics, federal states with unitary ones, and they'll be expected to create a system that hopefully pleases each one sufficiently. All in all, although the differences between the two are practically endless and somewhere near impossible to actually describe, it's still a worthwhile effort to try and figure a few out and also discuss them. In some way, Europe has more breathing room to understand what it wants to be, which is no easy task, because whatever you think Europe is, it can still look across the Atlantic and realize what it definitely is not.